In this screencast, we'll build on the framework that we were introduced to in the first screencast and start to learn about how to recognize the distribution of disease within the lung. At the end of this screencast, I want you to be able to describe the common patterns of disease distribution. Location. I break it down into these simple three categories. Is it diffuse? If it's not diffuse, is it central or peripheral? If it's not necessarily central or peripheral, is it involving predominantly the upper lobes or predominantly the lower lobes? I've provided you a graphical representation of what I think of as a diffuse disease process, and then I've given you an example of a person with a diffuse disease process on chest radiograph. You can see in the graphical representation and in the radiograph that the upper lungs are involved and the lower lungs are involved, and it's relatively uniform in terms of the involvement of the upper and the lower lungs. If we look at the chest CT in this same patient, you can see that the entire lung isn't necessarily affected, but the pathology in the upper lobes is pretty similar to that in the lower lobes, and there's not an upper lobe or lower lobe predominance. This process, just to start introducing you to some of the terms, it was an acute process, I'm calling it diffuse in terms of its pattern. It has ground glass opacity and smooth septaline thickening, things that we'll learn about in future podcasts. We see no pleural effusions and no cardiomegaly. So I just took you sort of through that D-ALPO approach to this particular radiograph. And this person had acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is often a diffuse process characterized by non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. When you think about processes that aren't diffuse, I want you to think about central versus peripheral or upper lobe versus lower lobe. In this case, I've given you a graphical representation of a central process. These central processes often occur around the large pulmonary arteries and veins or around the large airways in the center of the lung. This is a graphical representation and a companion radiograph in which we can see this central process in the lung. Now I would argue that it looks somewhat diffuse and there is probably involvement uh, of the entire lung, but we can see this concentrated density centrally around the heart. And that's why I would call this a central process. When you think about a peripheral process, we look at you know, these different examples of different peripheral processes you might see. And I have an example here where we see an opacity that's really touching the pleura in the periphery of the lung. And there's relatively normal lung around the mediastinum and the central vessels. This is showing you that same process on chest CT, and you can see how the process actually goes up to the pleura. It's almost wedge-shaped. It has some components of ground glass and consolidation, and this is due to a pulmonary embolus resulting in a pulmonary infarct. The ground glass and the consolidation are relatively nonspecific and could be caused by aspiration or pneumonia, but in this case it's hemorrhage related to the pulmonary infarct. Some people have described this as Hampton's hump, and this is a classic radiographic finding of pulmonary infarct in the setting of a pulmonary embolus. Let's talk a little bit about distinguishing upper versus lower lobe processes. When you look at this chest radiograph, we can see that there is increased opacification in the right lung. When we think about where that opacification is occurring, I outline it here with these yellow lines. 
and we see that it's really impacting the upper lobe of the right lung. The diaphragm on the right side is nice and crisp, both on the frontal and lateral radiographs, and so we can be pretty confident that this is something really involving the upper lobes as opposed to involving the lower lobes. In this case, it is an upper lobe pneumonia in which we have dense consolidation involving only the upper lobes. There is a little bit of adenopathy in the mediastinum, and this ends up being a bacterial pneumonia, very similar in its appearance and location to the prior case that was caused by pulmonary embolus. Remember that airspace filling can occur from many different etiologies, but commonly fluid, pus, or blood, and the radiographic appearance of airspace filling by different types of fluid, pus, or blood can be very difficult to distinguish and you often have to rely on your clinical information. Again, this was a right upper lobe bacterial pneumonia. In this case, as we look at the frontal and lateral radiographs, the main difficulty I think here is deciding whether this is a diffuse process or whether it's a lower lobe process. And I would argue that this is a lower lobe process. And that's because most of the density is occurring down here and we're losing that sharp margin of the diaphragm. The upper lobes, while they may have some increased density, are actually relatively clear. And so this looks like a lower lobe process to me, and that's going to be important in distinguishing and, and narrowing our differential. When we look at the CT in this same patient, we can confirm that it really is a lower lobe predominant process. There may be a little bit of abnormality or airspace opacity in the upper lobe, but we can see very dense airspace filling or consolidation in the lower lobes. And this de dependent or dense airspace consolidation that has a lower lobe predominance ends up being aspiration. And aspiration is more commonly seen in the lower lobes or in the dependent portions of the lungs. In summary, when you first approach a chest radiograph, before you start to think about its pattern, start to decide whether it's a diffuse process, central or peripheral, or upper lobe or lower lobe, and use that location or the distribution of the disease to help you narrow your differential in the setting of your clinical information.